Hey everybody, Joshua Vi here, pastor for Christian Community Church of Fullerton, and happy to be guiding you through this season of our online Bible studies. We've been on hiatus during the Christmas season and New Year's, and I hope everybody had a great holiday season as we were gone most of December, but we are glad to be back on our new night, Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. We hope that you're able to join us live every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. If you're not able to, uh, we will have our Bible studies on demand, as we always have, and uh, we will feature uh, a week, uh, whatever the current Bible study is, on the front page of our homepage at www.c3fullerton.com um, for the whole week. And so if you're used to watching on Mondays at 7, you'll still be able to tune in right there. Um, or if this uh, time works out better, uh, for you, then we're really glad that we can uh, make that adjustment for you. Uh, also, want to remind you that you can always check out our uh, Sunday morning messages live uh, every Sunday on um, our website, www.c3fullerton.com at 11.30 a.m., right around there. And uh, we would just love for you to join us. And of course, if you're in the Fullerton or North Camp, North Orange County area, we would love for you to join us as well. Tonight's Bible study, we're going to be looking at a very famous scripture. We thought if it's a new year and it's a new season of these Bible studies, then we should come back very strong. And it just so happens on Sunday mornings, we're going through a really incredible uh, message series, um, all centered around the question of who is Jesus. And uh, it takes place in John. And so while we don't do any kind of series or um, overly complicated Bible studies, uh, we wanted to bring a little taste of that to our online Bible study tonight. And so my good friend and associate Christian Bass uh, for the uh, Bible study that some of you get at church, he did his on John chapter 3, and I'm going to be doing the online Bible study on a facet of John chapter 3. And then we're actually going to be bringing that message later this year as we get closer to Easter. And so we're going to get a really neat kind of um, multifaceted look at one of the most well-known and beloved passages of scripture and things that have quite frankly ever been written in history. And so tonight um, I'm going to be guiding us through and then we look forward to doing even more with this text uh, as we get closer to the Easter season. So John chapter 3 is where we're at and I want to key in especially right around um, verse 17. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 17. So we're actually never, not even going to touch the most beloved scripture of all time, John chapter 3, 16. We'll see that a little bit later uh, this year as we get closer to Easter. But we're going to be starting right at John chapter 3, verse 17. And considering the fact that our Bible study audience is so astute in the Bible, uh, I'm not going to be giving the... Um, an overly long backstory into this text as well. I think almost everybody has heard uh, something about this text before. Now, if you've never heard anything about John chapter 3 before, maybe never heard anything about the Bible before, you're checking out this online Bible study, and this is kind of your first time ever doing anything like this, uh, don't worry, because I think tonight's Bible study is going to apply to you just fine. You don't need to know the entire backstory of what's going on in this chapter. Uh, we just want to focus on the concepts that Jesus is talking about in a few verses beginning at John 3, 17. And while you turn over there, I want to ask you this question. What is the opposite of being afraid of the dark? What is the opposite of being afraid of the dark? Well, when I was a kid, and maybe even a little bit now today, uh, my biggest fear was the dark, just finding myself in darkness. And um, I can remember, uh, even, even to this day, you might giggle about this, I still prefer to have some kind of light source on. It doesn't have to be anything big. Some kind of light source. Um, today, more because I'm afraid of stumbling around if I have to wake up in the middle of the night. But when I was a kid, I was absolutely terrified of the dark. And I can remember uh, when I was really, really young, 
uh, I had, I'd have these stuffed animals on the shelf and in the darkness as kind of the pale moonlight would glow into my room, it would just make these otherwise cute and cuddly stuffed animals look absolutely terrifying. Um, and so I much preferred <laughs> and have preferred most of my life to just kind of some kind of light source. And I've met other people who have that same kind of fear. So I know it's not completely irrational. Um, but what is the opposite of being afraid of the dark? What's the opposite of having that fear that just terrorized me as a kid? We're going to look at a, at a famous sermon by Jesus in which he suggests that there's something opposite of being afraid of the dark. In fact, it's even worse than the night terrors that plagued me as a young child. And in fact, it often goes with us as adults. It, it plagues and terrorizes our behavior as adults. And it's found in John chapter 3, verse 17. It says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. For God did not send his son to condemn the world, but through him the world might be saved. It's a powerful powerful scripture and I've grown up in the church and I've been around some kind of facet of Christianity most of my life and so I've been privy to a lot of people who have made the statement that the real power in John chapter 3 is really not in 316 that's the famous memory verse that most of us can quote from memory or have some familiarity with the real power of, of who Jesus is comes in John 3.17. And John 3.17 clearly states that when Jesus came into this world, his mission, his focus, what he was bringing, the kingdom of God that he preached and brought, was not to condemn this world, but to save it. Powerful thought, especially for today where in so many churches we often speak about things we'd like to condemn. And in so much communication and rhetoric that's spilling out over the dialogue, especially particularly here in America, so many speeches, so many statements, so many negative words that just run rampant with the idea of condemnation. And in, in many ways, Christians have really gotten behind this, and this isn't a new phenomenon. The idea of the preacher standing, Bible-clutched, screaming about hell, fire, and brimstone, that's been in some way, shape, or form a part of Christianity for a long time. And if it's not that kind of overt exaltation that people may have experienced in church, it's often the more even severe and dangerous form of subtle condemnation that people feel so often among God's people. That idea that you have to be a certain way, that you have to act a certain way, that you have to dress a certain way, maybe you have to be a certain skin color, or you have to have a certain amount in your bank account that you give in certain increments to the church offering plate, for acceptance. And if you don't fit that criteria, then you don't fit in. I wonder how many of our denominations 
how many of the various clubs and associations that have been built around Christianity are really built around the idea of keeping some people fenced in and keeping some people locked out. And the truth of the matter is that in the year 2016, all too often people don't consider churches to be places of liberation, but often a place of judgment and condemnation. And, and Christians, members of my church, friends, if we can't come to an understanding of that, then it's going to severely hamper our efforts to reach out to people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If, if we can't come to terms that so many people have had negative experiences of condemnation at churches, if we can't get on board with the fact that that exists, if we live in denial where we want to believe that somehow, some way, our religion, our faith is different and better, and we never have any of these problems, then the world is not going to take our message very seriously. And that's a problem. That's a real problem because it needs to. Now, if you have a Bible like mine that has the red letters, then you're familiar with the idea that when the text is read, it means Jesus actually has spoken these words, that these words are being attributed to Jesus himself. But when they're black, they're being spoken about something that maybe Jesus has said or summarizing an idea. And what John does a lot in his gospel is he tells certain stories for the purpose of us believing in Jesus. So I think what's interesting is most, uh, well, yeah, most people that I have met and talked to, they actually think that Jesus quoted John 3.16, 3.17, all these things. If you're familiar with John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. A lot of people think that Jesus said those words. He actually never said those words, at least not according to the one who includes these words in his gospel, the gospel that bears his name. That's John, the disciple whom is closest to Jesus. But what John says here is very much a part of the sermon of Jesus, the idea of Jesus, what we are believing. That John says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, reveals the identity of the Savior, of the God that we meet in Jesus Christ. So even though Jesus did not personally say these words, John is saying anyone who is going to be a believer of Jesus of Nazareth, anyone who is going to believe that salvation comes through him, that he is the way to God, and through him we, we find God, anyone who believes those things is going to see in Jesus no condemnation for the world. That's not part of his mission that he's on, according to John. And that's powerful. That's very powerful. Because we as human beings are not as charitable. We're just not. And John knows this. And that's why he follows up with this idea that This idea that, that Jesus has not come into the world to condemn the world and that you are either believing that or not believing that. That goes to the very heart of how we define our Christianity, but it goes to the very heart of what we mean as being faithful to God. If we live lives of constant critique and negativity and condemnation towards our fellow man, then the truth of the matter is we live in darkness and we have no part in believing in Jesus. 
That's what John is saying here. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. Who is that light? John has been talking about him. And that light is Jesus. But people, they loved the darkness instead of the light. And You know, I wanted to put this verdict to a test. So I did a social experiment using my iPhone here. Some of you may be familiar with reading news online. Maybe use a laptop like the one we use to broadcast this uh, Bible study. Maybe you use your iPad or, like me, you use the phone. Those of you who know me really well know just about every morning I get up, kind of the same routine, I have a cup of coffee, and I spend about 10, 15 minutes reading the news and uh, just kind of acquainting myself with what's going on in the world. And attached to news stories are comment sections. In fact, comment sections are on just about every single news item that you can think of. And uh, one of the big stories that's happened in our nation in the last few days is the, and, and particularly in our kind of surrounding area, we live very close to Los Angeles, is that uh, the Rams, the St. Louis Rams, who were once the LA Rams, who will become the LA Rams once again. And this time they'll even be closer to Los Angeles versus uh, in Angel Stadium where they used to play, where my beloved Angels play. Had to kind of work that in. And um, obviously this is a big news item. And so I went and just kind of Googled LA Rams and brought up the first story that came up. and. Um, it, it was kind of an interesting story. It was about uh, current uh, St. Louis Rams players, shouldn't be LA Rams players, using the social media uh, service app Twitter to um, just send some messages about their opinion about the move. And a lot of them were really overly positive. A lot of them were overly positive towards the residents in the city of St. Louis. And uh, I'll just read a few of them right here. This is from Alec Ogletree. Um, Appreciate the support and love we got here in St. Louis. Definitely will miss this place. Now it's time for a fresh start. Seems pretty upbeat, pretty positive. Um, here's another one um, from uh, Chris Long. Humbly, eternally grateful. Thank you, St. Louis. I'm sorry we fell short the past eight years. You treated me like family anyways. I love y'all. Again, very positive, very uplifting. Um, again, another really uh, interesting tweet, Robert Quinn. Thank you, St. Louis, for all the great memories created, and thank you, fans, for all the support. And um, so here we have some messages from current players to fans in St. Louis. Obviously, a lot of fans are going to be disappointed when their team moves to not just another city or new, another area, but literally another region in the United States. And uh, I guess our expectation would be that these players would say something positive or nice, or at least try to compliment the community. If you go to the comment section where anybody who's reading this article can make a statement, uh, oftentimes under just an anonymous name or account, I just kind of started thumbing through all of these different comments and every single one of them is negative. Some of them I can't actually read. It uh, wouldn't be appropriate to the Bible study, but let me share a few of these. Note to LA fans, don't become too emotionally attached to your new team, new old team. You should eschew any team gear or player shirt. Just ask the fans in St. Louis. Eventually, the owner will milk L.A. out of everything he can take. Probably move the team to Arizona, who will move to their original city of St. Louis. And by then, the Colts should be back in Baltimore. NFL fans continue to be suckered into a misguided sense of loyalty to their current home team, despite the fact that the owners will get pick up and move as soon as they can get a better deal elsewhere. I mean, think about it. Somebody sat down to just write this diatribe of, you know, negativity, but we can probably understand the outrage here. Uh, but it, it kind of really turns interesting after a while. Uh, people start to pull in other events from what's happened in the city. So uh, this 
anonymous commenter named Randy says they must endeavor to pers persevere in their hands up, don't shoot practice too, which is crazy because they're using a sports story. This guy is using a sports story. You can be absolutely disappointed that one team is moving out to connect it to a heart-wrenching series of events going on in this nation between minority communities and police officers. And regardless, again, of how you feel about one team moving from one area to another, this is hardly the forum to delve into such dark opinions and ideas. And then here we go to uh, one person writing this. Uh, my enthusiasm for the NFL and football in general have never been the same dating back to when Cleveland lost the Browns. I still watch it, but the excitement is gone. Hopefully, karma will punish the NFL for their greed. Greed, all capital letters. Being a Cleveland fan, I know how you feel, St. Louis. And then finally, somebody takes a moment and writes about how this event makes them think about not just sports teams moving from one area to another, but jobs moving from this country to another place. Over and over and over and over again, I was cycling through these comments, one negative comment after another, and it hit me. Throughout all these comments, I must have looked at like over a hundred of them. Not a single positive one. Not one LA fan getting on and saying, hey, it's great to have football back in LA. Not one Rams fan disappointed about his team moving, but saying thanks for the memories. Just negativity after negativity after negativity. And remember, I shared the appropriate ones. There were often much strongly worded ones. Big deal, sports, people say all kinds of things about this. It's not that big of an issue. Okay, you found a negative story for, for many and uh, found negative comments attached to it. Big deal. What does that prove? Well, my second step in this kind of social experiment was to use a different kind of story, a positive story. How could anyone possibly come up with a negative comment to this headline? Man who's blind in one eye forms bond with an unwanted puppy, also born with one eye. Let me read that news title again. Man who's blind in one eye forms bond with unwanted puppy, born with one eye. I found this on Huffington Post. Uh, published on January 5th, 2016, if you want to read the original article. And the news title says it all. It's a really, really beautiful story about a gentleman who has this disability who has found in this, this adorable little puppy. I mean, if you want to go look at the picture, it's just Google this headline and, and you'll see. It's, how could anyone think of something negative to say. And so I put that to the test. I said, I wonder. Now, obviously, the vast majority of comments attached to this were much, much more light and friendly, uh, like Mary Kirchner Hodges, who said, it is a wonderful, happy story. So nice to read something sweet in this crazy world. Now this little puppy will have a great home. I really, really like this comment. Uh, Edward Stu said, I need a video of this for my own sanity. That dog is just super cute. Here's another person who wrote, and, and it's interesting, Robin Bond wrote, you restored my faith in humanity. Best wishes to you both. But and I won't say his full name here on Huffington Post, a gentleman by the name of George commented, oh, please, dot, 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 as if to be somewhat annoyed by such a fluffy and heartwarming story, which is a pretty negative comment, too. I mean, how in the world, even writing, oh, please, how in the world 
could you consciously log on to your account and write something negative about a story like this? So thankfully, I didn't run into some of the negative comments that I'd found in the previous article, but it really got me thinking as I was reading through some of these comments. They needed the story to have their faith in humanity restored. They needed this story to make sense of an insane world. And George, wherever you are, George, I don't know what's going on in your life, but to look at this beautiful picture of a gentleman who's blind in one eye, holding on tight to this cute little adorable puppy whom he has an incredible bond through this disability. I just don't understand what's oh please about that. But I just come back to some of these comments. It's as if we're having to consciously seek out any bit of good, any bit of light. Because all too often, what we experience is the negative, the dark. And yet, comments like George's, and, and so many comments like I found on the other news story, about something that's pretty trivial, Sports, I get that it's a big deal to people, for sure. I understand that it's going to impact economies. It's going to make a, a huge difference in many ways. But, but it's certainly, certainly not a life-changing event, for sure. It's amazing that it could still give birth to, to such incredible negativity, downright hatred spilling into sentiments that can be prejudice, that can be dark. So we return to John chapter 3, to what John says here. Here is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. What's the opposite of being afraid of the dark? It's being in love with it. It's seeking it out. It's performing those deeds. I read another heart-wrenching story about a woman who had just been married, was out on vacation on a conference and heard a knock on the door. A police officer was there. And he informed this woman, this young woman, that her husband had just been arrested, fully confessing, to an unspeakable crime. Now, her husband had been found guilty of murder about 15 years prior to them meeting, falling in love, and getting married. He had no history of violent criminal activity, and so the judge at that time decided to give him somewhat of a lenient sentence, 10 years in prison and a lifetime of parole, at the idea that somehow, some way, maybe he would be the exception, that they could rehabilitate him, release him back out into society. After all, his, his crime, which was horrible, horrendous, he took the life of, of his girlfriend. It was a crime of passion. And for 15 years, he served his time, he got his education, he got a job, he kept up with his parole. He was turning out to be a success story. Until one day when he brutally assaulted two women who came into the store that he was running. I was reading this personal story this young woman wrote. She's relaying this, this horrendous tale. 
And I thought to myself, why does she share this? Why does she share the story of heartbreak? Why does she share a story that seems to reveal the very worst in humanity? No doubt for many personal reasons, some therapeutic, some solidarity with the victims, maybe helping her make sense of this horrible thing that's gone on in her life. But it, for me, reading this, it, it serves as an all too important reminder that there is darkness in this world, that we are capable of doing horrible things. And sometimes, even when we're given another chance, we're given every opportunity, we'll still find a way to mess it up. And honestly, that's not dependent upon the color of our skin. That's not dependent upon whether we're rich or poor. That isn't dependent on what country we're born, or what language we speak. The X factor is sin. It's the content of our character. It's the fact that there is a part of us, there is a yearning in us to go towards that darkness. And if we are going to find a way out of that, It means turning our attention, our focus, and our philosophy towards the light. And the light is Jesus. Now, I've been going on and on about some really heavy things, some horrible things. And certainly not my favorite subject. For those of you who follow this Bible study, you know we tend to look at a few more lighter things. But, you know, when I think about it, there's just too much negativity that we're being tempted to buy into, even in churches today. And stories like the ones that I have shared, whether they're found in comment sections or personal horrific accounts, like the one this young woman shared that I read about, they kind of stand as little moments to be tempted to think that this world is completely irredeemable. And I get that. I understand that. I can understand why some people say things are just getting worse. Things are going to hell in a handbasket. Or saying things like it ain't like it used to be. I fear the problem is it is like it used to be in too many bad ways. But there is another way. There's another way to think about this world. And there's another way to hopefully project the light onto people in it. And that is to adopt the mindset of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who intimately understood the darkness within. And yet when he came, he came not to condemn, but to save it. How do we make things better in our community? How do we make things better in our world as we've entered this brand new year? How do we Find a way to come together when we're constantly being reminded of all that makes us different. It's the light. It's the understanding that we find in Jesus. 
that first, our job isn't one of condemnation. That to go to the comment section and just perpetuate more negativity, that's a, ultimately a choice we make. And as believers in Christ, we don't have to make it. We can go a different way. And what is that different way? It's to wake up every single morning to greet your work, to greet your school, to greet your community, to greet your family, to greet your friends, to greet your enemies. With the never ending mission to save it in big and small ways. How do we save our world? That seems like an impossible task. Well, we can choose to look at a world that's negative and full of darkness and horrible stories, and there'll be no end to what we find. We can also see the positive contributions of people, especially churches, especially Christians, each and every single day. People who are going across the globe to dig wells, to provide goats, to give the gift of food to people who are hungry and starving, to honestly introduce to a community clean, drinkable water that not only sustains life, but defeats disease. We can see it in senior centers across the country as people volunteer their time to help those who didn't save enough or didn't have the opportunity to. Or just spend time with those who have been forgotten. We see it all across this country in the hope that we have for kids who are coming out of all walks of life as we hold on to the idealness that it can be better for them. And if you are a believer in Christ like me, that means you continue to believe and you continue to push forward with the idea that as long as we are here, as long as Jesus tarries, as long as we preach, as long as we sing, as long as we worship, there's something truly good and pure and amazing and life-filled in this world. And maybe for one more soul, Salvation will come to their house. Whoever lives by truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. How we choose to live, the things that we do, the things that we say, the opinions that we hold, what we do with the tools and resources we have, ultimately, we are accountable, not to some church leadership, not to some high and pious religious organization, not to someone with an incredibly impressive hat, or a long list of letters and symbols at the ends or front of their names. What each of us does is plainly seen and accountable in the sight of God. So when we make that decision to wake up every single day, seizing it in big and small ways to do something to save it, We step into the light where Jesus is. We know his truth and we believe his message. And I think if we're doing that as individuals, we're gonna be pretty effective. 
But when we agree to do it in concert, churches across the world, Christians across communities, then we are going to start to see an impact, an amazing opportunity, an incredible revolution. But most importantly, we'll be honoring God by walking in his steps. Thank you so much for watching this online Bible study. We're really excited to bring you guys even more. And so we'll bring, be bringing you a new one every single Wednesday night at 7 p.m. right here at www.c3fullerton.com. We hope that you'll uh, visit us on Sunday mornings, either live or online, as we bring the message and uh, look for amazing and fun new content throughout the year as we continue to build this online ministry. God bless you guys so much. Now let's go walk in the light as he is in the light and make this a great new year.